Hello and thanks for watching this webinar. My name is Detlef Ritter. I'm scientist at the Fraunhofer ITEM Hanover, Germany. Our work here at the Institute is focusing biological effects of inhalable substances and we apply a wide range of testing strategies and models, including in silico, in vitro, ex vivo and in vivo systems, up to clinical trials such as early phase and proof of concept studies. Today I would like to speak about inhalation toxicity testing in vitro and give a brief overview on experimental designs, concepts and capabilities using optimized approaches and the human lung cell line. I will subdivide my talk into a couple of chapters, including some facts about the motivation and the scientific and technical background and strategies that we apply in our studies, how to assess different kinds of inhalable substances and relevant approaches with some examples from our lab, and some words about reproducibility during the testing and ways to achieve in vitro in vivo correlations. So what is our aim? The final aim could be to have the possibility to assess any kind of inhalable mixture to explore its biological effects in relevant setups by cell-based in vitro approaches. And moreover, to apply this for the testing of single substances, for example for regulatory purposes, as well as for complex mixtures that might be relevant for environmental or workplace situations. In the context of this presentation, these approaches would be directed to detect local acute lung toxicity in the sense of OECD testing guidelines for acute effects. The biological situation in the lung is well known. We have biological barriers separating the inner body from the outer compartment, a functional organization of different cell types, regional characteristics of the lung depending on biological functions, and we have complex ventilation and fluid dynamics. Together, this leads to complex conditions with respect to regional particle deposition, inhaled material absorption, and influence of regional biological characteristics on the bioavailability and toxicity of substances during inhalation. If we now want to create a model system for this complex reality, we have to reduce the system to its most important characteristics, which should then be representative enough to let us conclude consequences for reality. Under these conditions, the resembling of a biological barrier function in a relevant exposure situation should be one fundamental requirement for this kind of approach. Airlifted interface cultures can realize such a reduced model. Cells or tissues are cultured on a microporous membrane, humidified and nourished from culture media on the basal side and efficiently exposed to the air on the apical surface. Aerosols, gases or pharmaceuticals can be set up using appropriate technologies and then can be brought into contact with the cells under efficient conditions. Hence, both biological as well as exposure relevance can be realized based on an elegant interface culture exposure approach. A large number of biological models for inhalation research has been established. It spans a wide range from simpler models such as single cell type cultures up to animal in vivo models or epidemiologic data. Usually throughput, reproducibility and lower costs are seen as pro arguments for the simpler systems and in vivo relevance is seen as the most striking argument for the more complex test systems. Meanwhile, also a large in vitro toolbox of models is present, sharing varying characteristics with respect to several aspects, but in summary it is clear that there is no one-for-all solution. However, during this presentation aiming on routine acute local inhalation testing in vitro, I will focus on the A549 cells representing a single cell line model in an air-lifted interface culture application. A549 cells are from an alveolar origin and remain some type 2 cell characteristics. They are in use since decades in the field of in vitro and thus there is an enormous amount of references of the cells covering all kinds of research. Although being a cell line, interesting features have been shown such as metabolization and surfactant production. Although the presence of tight junctions is, is, is under discussion, A549 cells have also been applied for nanoparticle absorption research. As a cell line, A549 cells are commercially available from cell banks and the unlimited availability of these cells at low costs is an unmatched advantage over primary cells, especially for routine testing, data bank establishment and setup of historical controls over years. To expose elegant interface cultures to airborne substances, exposure equipment is needed that complies with the challenging conditions needed for a mild but efficient cell exposure. The ExpoCube is based on a standard 12-well elegant interface culture plate and enables the exposure of two different exposure groups and a non-exposure group at the same time. 
The standard plate design also enables an exposure of the cells with only a low volume of media beneath, without changing before or after the exposure. Therefore, it is extremely valuable in performing repeated dose exposures, ADME approaches or analysis of chemokinous secretions. Additional features of the Expo Cube include a very compact design with an individual elicit interface culture exposure in an efficient stagnation flow setup and the prevention of the irrelevant secondary exposure route through the culture medium. Moreover, we included the thermophoresis effect to improve particle deposition onto the cellular surfaces from aerosols by application of a low temperature gradient of 15 degrees centigrade between the aerosol and the exposed cell cultures, it is possible to improve the particle deposition rate to 30% and higher for smaller particle sizes. By principle, this thermal gradient will not affect the cells in any way. Additionally, the ExpoCube offers the unique possibility to combine it with a fluorescence reading system and the exposure effect can be observed non-invasively and online using fluorescence life standing conditions. So these are methods we use currently and I will now give you some examples from studies what is accessible with that and what kind of results one can expect in experimental designs with the A549 human lung cell line. The first example includes testing of gases and volatiles. In principle, any of the setups we used consists of four functional parts for generation of the test substance in an airborne state, dilution, exposure of cells and analytical equipment for online determination of the dose as far as applicable. You will see that the setups are very comparable and in principle only include variations in generation and analytical methods depending on the physical chemical characteristics of the test substances. Here, volatiles are evaporated under controlled conditions and actual concentrations are determined online by FDIR spectrometry. In this case, a matrix of four volatiles was chosen, including toxic, non-toxic, hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances. Those response relationships were established by exposure of A549 cells for one or two hours to varying volatile gas phase concentrations. The results show that it was possible to generate reproducible dose response data also from the less toxic and hydrophobic compounds. This is of high importance for the testing since it allows ranking of the acute inhalation toxicity characteristics including all classes from GHS1 toxic to GHS4 or 5 less toxic compounds. The next couple of slides is directed towards the applicability of the test to dry particle aerosols. Since we know now that the biological effect and the toxicity of airborne substances is dependent on surface characteristics and particle sizes, it is important to test these materials from an airborne state and not in solution under submerged culture conditions or droplet aerosol exposure. To generate dry particle aerosols for testing in an airlifted interface setup, several methods can be applied, mainly dependent on physical chemical characteristics of the material. This may be conducted by disintegration techniques from bulk material or condensation methods as a bottom-up design. The first example is a setup for generation of dry particle aerosols from solvable materials. Here, the droplet aerosols are generated and dried by dilution in dry air and result in dry particle aerosols with a highly defined particle size distributions. These can then be monitored by scattering light photometry or gravimetrical analysis and are deposited on the exposed cells. To generate dry particle aerosols from bulk materials, dust feeders such as shown on the right side of the slide or disintegration systems such as shown in the experimental setup figure can be used and reproducibly deliver aerosols for particle deposition on the cellular surfaces. Under these exposure conditions, a large range of dosages can be realized leading to dose response curves as depicted on the right side of the slide. In this case, two fungicides were tested and two clearly distinct toxic potentials were documented by the assay. This is in good agreement with the in vivo data, as we will see later on. To shed a light also on the accessibility of complex aerosols by in vitro testing, the combustion aerosol of a conventional cigarette is the first example here. A conventional automated smoking machine can be used to generate the mainstream smoke according to smoking guidelines such as isonorms and the smoke is then diluted in clean air and conducted to the cells puff by puff. 
The diagram on the right side shows the particle concentration against the time during this intermittent exposure design with a clean air exposure period in between the two following puffs. Exposures of A509 cells in such a system result in dose response relationships as shown here for typical viability assays with a clear definition of a toxic dose range on the right side of the gray area in the dose response figure. But it is also possible to study more mechanistic changes in such an experimental setup. For example, by analysis of intercellular changes in the glutathione system. Immediately after exposure, we find a dose-dependent depletion of the reduced glutathione content in the non-toxic concentration range. 24 hours later, this picture is completely changed due to the activation of the cellular detoxification system. The intercellular content of reduced glutathione has come back to the control level with a slight overshoot reaction at these dosages, and the redox ratio of oxidized and reduced glutathione is strongly increased in the toxic dose ranges in A549 cells. The next example is the determination of the toxicity of aerosols from a worst case scenario, in this case the explosion of a lithium ion battery. These batteries are widely in use in mobile phones, entertainment technologies, in cars and other larger installations. In case of a battery failure, they can easily explode and produce a large amount of aerosol containing organic and anorganic materials both in the gas and particulate phase of the aerosol. An in vitro exposure of A549 cells resulted in a dose response curve as shown on the right side of the slide. And by comparison of these results to dose response curves from conventional cigarette smoke with or without particles under comparable exposure conditions, the high toxic potential of the battery aerosol is indicated. As a third and last example for complex aerosol applications, we will have a short look on the testing of a workplace relevant aerosol that might be produced during use of a hair straightener product by professional hairdressers. After development of an appropriate setup and procedure, it was possible to handle the consumer product completely according to the manufacturer's advice and hairdresser's practice during the in vitro testing and by that generate a high relevance of the test aerosol. Again, A549 cells were exposed and in this case indicated no significant cell toxic potential up to the highest technical concentrations of the aerosol which were, as a worst case scenario, clearly above real world conditions. So these were five examples how to assess inhalation toxicity by in vitro methods, but as these are results from a model system, the question is how to elaborate the relevance of these results for the human inhalation situation. I would like to introduce two strategies that have successfully applied in our studies. The first one uses positive and negative control substances with known human inhalation relevance in the study. Three examples include lactose aerosol that can be used as negative control. This component is largely in use and known for its hazard-free characteristics. Sodium dodecyl sulfate and copper sulfate, on the other hand, have clearly defined toxic properties with a relevance for human inhalation. In the case of copper sulfate, also based on epidemiologic data from vineyard workers. After application of these substances in the dry aerosol testing scenario in our assay, we can see very clearly that these characteristics are resembled under in vitro conditions. Up to highest aerosol concentrations, lactose does not induce significant effects on the viability of exposed A549 cells and induced interleukin-8 as a marker of cellular irritancy only very slightly, whereas SDS and kappa sulfate dose-dependently induce cell death and strong interleukin-8 release. For a discussion of the in vivo relevance of these results, they can be correlated to the cellular sulfate load of the cells during exposure. On the one hand, this now enables an extrapolation of the equivalent human lung exposure per inner lung surface. On the other hand, results from the test substances can now be classified. In the case of the results from the testing of aerosols during use of the hair straightening product, we see that the surface loads during these exposures were in a toxic and interleukin-8 inducing range when using both positive substances. Hence, we can deduct that the toxic potential of the test aerosol would have been observable in the test system if present. A second approach to achieve in vitro to in vivo correlations in inhalation testing can be the comparison to data bank results. The ECHA data bank, ChemID Plus or others represent sources of in vivo inhalation testing data which can be used to set up a quantitative in vitro to in vivo correlation.
In the case of the example from testing of volatiles, EC50 values were calculated from those response curves and plotted against the in vivo data, usually from OECD 4 hour acute inhalation tests. Although this is a rather small data set of four substances, the figure already indicates a good correlation between in vitro and in vivo acute inhalation toxicity. In the case of dry particle aerosols, the figure on the right side represents data from the testing of fungicides, which we have seen before. Also in this case, the in vivo data could be retrieved from data banks. Again, we see that in vitro A509 exposure data correlate very well with in vivo data from rodent acute inhalation toxicity testing. To enable in vitro toxicity testing, a large number of single cultures is necessary. For instance, a testing of three substances with two control substances and six dosages would require 300 single aliquid interface cultures. At the same time, this is resulting in costs that call for a cell line more than for an expensive primary cell culture system and can only lead to relevant results when a high robustness and reproducibility is given. The data from this slide shows results from viabilities and interleukin-8 secretions using A549 cells in a study including more than 120 single experiments. Raw data for non-exposure controls on the left as well as clean air exposure controls on the right indicate a good homogeneity of data during the whole experimental period. For data bank establishment, establishment of historical controls and as an overall fundamental for relevance of data, reproducibility is necessary. In inhalation toxicity testing, this is practically a challenge, since generation, exposure and analysis of exposure doses are additional factors to the usual conditions in cell culture, which might induce variations of the results. However, as it is indicated on the left-hand figure on this slide, a reproducibility over years can be achieved using a saline based aliquid interface in vitro assay also by application to the testing of volatiles or gases. In this case, formaldehyde as an example. But it can also be realized in testing dry particle aerosols as shown with the EC50 data from testing sodium dodecyl sulfate with a repetition two years later. So, as a summary, I would like to highlight the capabilities of using a cell line such as the A549 cells in an aliquid interface inhalation toxicity in vitro approach. Although there might be limitations with regard to complexity of this single cell line model, it might be applied to the testing of gases, vapors or complex atmospheres with good reproducibility. The results document a high relevance for acute inhalation toxicity testing with such an assay, at least as we can say for the limited amount of substances tested. And as a final conclusion, this testing design might be well qualified for acute inhalation testing, whereas the next steps of toxicity evaluation, mechanistic studies or pharmacological research might involve more complex cell systems to resemble in vivo conditions as much as possible. And with this, I would like to thank all my colleagues from the ETEM and SKY who have contributed to this work. Thank you for listening and wish you a good day.